are live. Welcome everyone to yet another week of Ask the Cleaning Expert. I'm your host, Melissa Homer, Chief Cleaning Officer of Microfiber Wholesale. I am here to answer all of your cleaning questions. No questions too big or too small. My goal is to help everyone. I have been in the professional cleaning industry for over 20 years, helping some of the biggest franchises in the residential cleaning world. I've also worked with some of the large commercial cleaning franchises and largest manufacturers, including Procter & Gamble, one of the largest manufacturers of cleaning chemicals. I'm here to help you with anything from how to get stains off surfaces to how to repair damage you've done from cleaning something incorrectly to if you're a professional cleaner and looking for advice on how to grow your cleaning business. I'm here to everyone. So without further ado, and to this theme. And this week's theme is laundry care. Laundry is a huge struggle for home consumers and professionals because it's so misunderstood. The reality is that most people really don't understand the chemistry behind what they're doing when they run the laundry. They buy products that are popular, they throw it in the machine, they hit a couple buttons because it looks like what should be happening, and you know, cross their fingers and hope for the best. I want to take you away from all that. I want to give you enough of a primer that going forward you actually understand what's going on when you hit go on that machine and how to get the most out of your laundry and keep your clothes and your cleaning goods performing longer. Because at the end of the day, the greenest thing you can is preserve the things you've bought. <coughs> uh, th things that you've bought. Sorry, I lost my uh, language there for a moment. So let's talk laundry fundamentals. These days, most people are probably using their machine and not hand washing. The days of the bucket and uh, plunge and scrub are pretty limited. Um, but people are still hand washing for delicates. But we're going to focus on machine work because that's where that's where the action is, okay? Big thing number one that I think most people misunderstand today is the change that has happened due to high efficiency laundry. I don't think people really get the scope of what's involved. So everyone knows, oh, we now have these front loaded machines. When maybe my parents are growing up or I was younger, we had this top load machine with a little agitator in the middle, you took a big cup of detergent, you dumped it in, you ran the machine, and magic happened. The advent of high efficiency machines has changed laundry in a way that most people don't get. So, big thing you need to understand first is the drastic change in water consumption. When I'm telling you that the high efficiency machines cut water usage by at least a half to possibly more, depending on the model you're using. I'm not exaggerating. It is a massive reduction in the use of water, which means they had to drastically change all the formulas of detergent to accommodate that letter, less water usage. They're now using agitation, the rotation of the machine and the little dance it does to scrub with less water to get the same amount of soil removal with a lot less waste, water heating, and overall impact on the environment. It's great, it's a wonderful thing, but it means laundry detergent changed. When laundry detergent was first invented and everyone was hand washing or washing in these old fashioned washing machines, they were made very thin. You would get you know, this big old cup, you know, cup on the top of your laundry detergent and it would take a full cup, like a half a cup of, or even three quarters of a cup of detergent to do a full wash load of heavy soiled items. Most current washing machines and most current detergents are designed that for a full machine, I'm talking that, you know, big LG you've been eyeing at Home Depot, full to the brim of towels and clothes, needs two ounces, fourth of a cup, that's it, of detergent maximum, maximum. Most of them you can get away with an ounce. So two ounces max. So that big cup you used to get is now down to a shot glass and nobody gets it. 
So they are dumping a ton of detergent in their machine. And as a result, they are actually making their laundry worse. Now you probably are thinking, it can't be that big of a deal. More detergent just means it's gonna get cleaner. <laughs> yeah, that's nice thought, but that's not actually how soap works. Soap or the surfactants in soap are designed to stick onto dirt molecules and oil and then stick in the water and pull those things up into the water into suspension so they can rinse away. Awesome. But here's a problem. Surfactants are really stubborn. When you don't give them anything to stick to, they get bored and they keep sticking to things. They never turn off. It's not like bleach where you put it on a surface and it gets consumed and fizzes and turns into salt water and expires and eventually it stops being bleach. Surfactants, the thing that makes soap soap, are forever surfactants. They don't stop. They literally have no, no, they are a ride or die to the end. So if they're not sticking to something, they are in a state of agitation and trying to find something to stick to. So here you are with your laundry and it's run out of dirt. There's no more dirt left because it had plenty of soap in that first ounce or two and you put in a whole cup. What do you think the other half a cup does? Do you think it sit there, sits there politely in the water waiting to get washed away? Nope. It sticks to the inside of your washing machine. It sticks to your clothes. It sticks to all the uh, dispenser and gear work and everything else it can and leaves residue everywhere. And that soapy, gunky residue creates a space for germs and bacteria to hang out and grow. It's making your clothes dirtier, not cleaner, because now they're filled with excess soap. It's making your machine slimy and gross because it's filled with excess soap. Trust me on this one. You think, oh, more detergent, you know, more is good. No, no, it's not. Use the right amount or you're actually making your machine dirtier and your clothes dirtier. And here's what's even more upsetting. If you have soap residue on your clothing or in your carpets or any place else you've used too much soap, water reactivates it. So let's say you shampooed your carpet and you left too much soap and there's soap residue. Every time you walk in with damp shoes from outside in the rain, the soap on your carpet is now going to attach and scrub your shoes and bond all that dirt from your shoes into the carpet. You're going to end up with all these dirty spots everywhere because the soap is still trying to do its job. Same thing with your clothing. If you've got soap residue in it, it's going to pick up more dirt and stains with humidity and moisture, with body sweat, and it's going to actually stain and discolor and darken faster if there's soap residue in it. So trust me, big number one, less soap. <coughs> big number two, stop overloading that poor machine. As I just mentioned, the big change in laundry was we tried to reduce water for the sake of the environment and are using agitation to compensate for the reduced water, which means if the stuff can't move, you're really screwed. Sorry, I said it out loud. The modern machine relies on that flopping action to scrub all the clothes against each other and get them clean. If they're all stuck and they can't move because you jammed the machine full of detergent and full of clothes, then nothing's getting clean. And now you've got a big issue. So if you want your clothes to come out cleaner, Fill the machine, but uh, think of that drama, that for, roll, you know, hole here. When you put it in, you really can't see that top like quarter. That's on purpose. It's to, to her, it's to deter you from jamming the machine all the way up in there. But I see some of you tucking it all in, trying to get every last towel in there. Don't do it. Put it in, leave the gap. When the water hits, it will naturally come down some more because clothes are actually fluffy. When they wet, they come down. And now there'll be plenty of room for all that lovely flopping action that we want that gets the clothes clean. If you've jammed it all in there, like uh, it's a laundry sack, when it gets wet, it's not gonna fall down far enough and things are kind of gonna a little bit on the top and it's not gonna get clean. And then you're gonna say, oh, my machine's not very good. And, and that's not true. Your machine's excellent. You're just um, sabotaging it. <laughs> so stop that. Um, the other big mistake in laundry is people don't understand the difference of all the additives they could be adding to their laundry cycle. So everyone knows detergent. Cool, it's the soap, it scrubs, it cleans. Honestly, for most laundry, you can do the whole job by itself. But there's tons of additives I could be adding. 
Um, there are stain removers, there are brighteners, there are softeners, and they all have wonderful properties, but you need to know what you need and how much. Again, we have a usage issue, particularly with fabric softener. Um, same thing as the detergent where it went from being a big cup to a little bit. There's a reason they have that dispenser tray on the top, people. It's to try to help you. Filling it up to max every time is not helping you. When you use that much conditioner in your machine, now the dispenser tray is getting gross and moldy and disgusting. Now the machine itself is getting slimy and gross and disgusting too. Um, and there's buildup in your clothing. There's a lot of reasons you don't want to drown them in uh, fabric softener. A dab will do you, as they say. Um, I got some questions coming in, which is awesome. Let me actually address those. So let's see here. My biggest question is how to clean the washing machine itself. Do I put vinegar or bleach in it, run a full cycle? If it has a clean cycle, which one of the washers does, do I run that with or without cleaning vinegar or liquid? All the questions. Great question, Crystal. Okay, so let's talk keeping that poor machine clean. If your machine has a cleaning cycle, by God, yes, use it. That is awesome. That is part of the functionality the engineers made on purpose to help you. So, you know, use it. In terms of what to put in there, at minimum, put nothing. If you're not, if you don't have the right products, nothing is better than the wrong products. So at minimum, put nothing. Just let the machine cycle run with uh, good old hot water and let the machine do its job because there's a lot of soap residue in the machine already. If you want to add something, I personally recommend a fresh. And here's why I recommend a fresh. So you will hear a lot of people online saying, add vinegar, which you know, is lovely. There's nothing wrong with vinegar, but I'll explain why a fresh is better. So vinegar is acetic acid 5%. Uh, everyone you know, says, oh, it's natural. It's a chemical. It's a chemically chemical. We got to get everyone on board here. Vinegar is acetic acid and it is acidic. It's pretty cool. Don't know how much to put in there. If you are being overly aggressive, just like most people are the detergents where they're putting this big cup of detergent, they put a big cup of vinegar in there every time too, you're going to start to compromise the gaskets and rubber bits within the machine and its workings. Um, most rubber bits like that gasket, like all the other you know, seals and uh, gaskets within the pipes and such inside the machine, are all acid sensitive. So if you're constantly dumping big wads of vinegar in there, especially at a very hot cleaning cycle, that is going to help soften and damage all the uh, rubber gaskets and workings within the machine. It's not a good day. A fresh does use acid as well, because you do need acid. Part of that cleaning cycle is removing hard water minerals and acids do help you remove those minerals. So they're important, but they use citric acid at a controlled amount. They tell you, hey, this is the one tablet you need for the wash. It's the proper amount per load. They've done the math for you, so you can't mess it up. And it's not as strong an acid as the vinegar choice. So you're going to get that same hard water removal without the risk of gasket damage. The other thing that Fresh has that the uh, vinegar cycle doesn't is they put in a lot of surfactants and chelating agents. Um, so I'll explain. Surfactants is going to stick on the uh basically like a rinse aid it's not going to be like detergent like we're dealing with they actually basically put like finish for lack of better terminology that type of rinse aid in the uh, fresh so it's helping to slough off and rinse off that soap residue which the vinegar isn't going to particularly do on its own the other thing is the keeling agents and um keeling agents is a term in the industry that talks about managing water hardness what happens in cleaning is when you're mixing anything with water, when you're mixing with the tap water in the community, you have to fight the chemicals that are already present in the water. Nobody's water is perfect. Uh, even if you have a great water treatment plant in your area, you have minerals and in some areas they're terrible. Um, and those minerals fight the soaps that are already in the formula and deact deactivate them because the soap is attacking those minerals instead of the thing you want it to clean. Keyletting agents are there to control the water hardness, to take those minerals out of play before the soap gets a chance to do its job. So um, the fresh tablet versus that vinegar is gonna have those key ligating agents to control the water that is being used in the wash cycle to make it less um, 
distracting to the soap and the vinegar, I'm sorry, the soap and the acids, so that they can do their thoroughly. So a fresh tablets, I think, are the way to go for most home consumers because it's the controlled amount, not too much acid, uh, killing agents to control the hard wa water problem, and um, rinse aid basically to help slough everything out of that machine and get it clean. <coughs> the one last thing you, you need to do manually, though, Crystal, is you want to clean the actual hard structure of the outside of the machine, your soap tray, and your gasket, it, presuming it's a front load. Uh, if it is a top load, same drill, but, you know, slightly different. Um, the machine is only going to clean the inner drum. That's its job. When you run the machine cycle, it's going to clean that drum. It's not going to necessarily be effective at the gasket. It's not going to be effective at the soap tray. It's not going to be effective at the exterior machine. That's all manual work by you. And in that case, you want to use uh, a all-purpose cleaner of your choosing to keep all those things clean. And depending on the age of your machine, you may need a bleach-based product to manage the gasket because old school front load washers had a problem with drainage that they've since corrected in modern machines, but the original OG front loads had that terrible drain problem. So the front gaskets would get all moldy and disgusting. Um, for those, you have to constantly kind of bleach clean them, trying to keep that problem at bay. It's not gonna solve the aesthetic problem. It's still gonna be ugly and uh, mold stained, and it's not gonna ever solve it, but at least it's keeping it under control until that machine eventually stops working and you upgrade to a machine that has a better gasket uh, design. Um, do not forget the soap tray. This is another one I see people make a mistake of all the time is the soap tray is often the biggest culprit to foul odors in a washing machine. Um, if people are overusing that detergent and overusing that fabric softener, it causes it to spray and stick all inside that whole cavity of the soap dispenser. And now mold and nastiness and algae stuff is growing inside that tray. It never gets addressed by the wash cycle cleaning and it just grows and grows in there until it's nasty. So um, pull the tray out. There's usually a little tab that you push in to get it all the way out and go ahead and go when you find in there, <laughs> wipe it all out, use something bleach be gross, clean it up good and use less detergent so it doesn't happen again. But great question. All right, let's see here. Got another question in here. I need the truth. Should we still be sorting our clothes when dealing with laundry, colors and fabrics? Great question, Eric. Oh, I love that question. So the answer is sorta. It's gonna be a mixed answer and I'll explain why. We are in a wonderful age where the chemists have improved laundry detergents. They can perform with less heat. For the most part, most people today do their laundry with way less heat than their moms, their grandmas. We used to boil laundry. We used to use extremely hot water because the soap wasn't very good and we needed that heat to melt all the junk out of the fibers. Now, modern detergents do a much better job. Most people are washing the normal cycle is warm. It's not boiling hot anymore. Um, so the dyes that are used to dye the fabrics have a better chance of holding on and not leaching out of the fabrics. Also, we wear far more synthetic fabrics than mom or grandma did. And synthetic fabrics are color fast, most part, like polyester, like this shirt, it's color fast. It's not gonna um, leach dye into the wash load the way an old school cotton dye pair of dungarees jeans would have. So if you are washing mostly modern synthetic fabrics and you're washing in warm or cold cycle, most likely you're not gonna have a dye that just mix the load. Now, why I say, mostly and maybe is you do need to be careful as you introduce new laundry into your laundry routine. Every time you buy a new garment, you're going to have to check out to see what's going on here. Some products are beautifully made, especially richly dyed, like a new pair of dark wash jeans or things like that. They tend some amounts of dye and it hasn't been washed out by the factory. And you need to address it before, before you introduce it into your laundry cycle if you don't want everything dyed blue. So if you are getting something new that's rich color. I suggest hand washing that before you let it into the general laundry population. Um, so that new, you know, burgundy red dress or those dark wash jeans, hand wash them in the sink and rinse out as much of that factory dye as you can. 
you know, rinse and ring and rinse and ring and wash it up. Just, you know, you a little bit of your normal laundry detergent until most of that excess dye has leached out. At that point going forward, you should be able to have that mixed load laundry and not have the risk. But if you take that new item straight out of the Amazon bag and shove it in the laundry, fingers crossed, but boo, you're in trouble. <laughs> okay. Cause sometimes you're going to get whacked and then we'll end up with bright pink clothes everywhere. Um, but I will say if you're still washing like grandma with the hot, hot cycle all the time, you got to be careful about mixing colors. You never want, for example, you know, that red dress in the middle of a bunch of white towels in the hot towel cycle, because that heat is going to cause it to leach a lot of dye and screw up all your towels. Let's see here. Oh, speaking of laundry and um, I'm realizing I have forgotten an important key step, which is for all of you guys on here, I owe you your coupon. Why didn't you all remind me I owe you your coupon? Then come on now. You guys know how this works. You come on here, you get the free cleaning advice, you have a lot of fun, and get discounts. So let's get some discounts. Our coupon this week is Laundry15. So Laundry15, we are doing the coupons after the theme of the week, which is always fun. So take 15% off any order from Microfiber Wholesale on me, Laundry15. Go out there and get some great stuff. Um, and help support this channel and all this content. So um, back to our questions. I got another one here. Any advice of getting dirt and grass stains out of baseball pants? Ooh, Tabby. Uh, great question, Renee. So the reality is that grass stains are hard and athletic wear is harder. You have you have picked the double hard and I want to make sure I get you the name of the right product that I want to make sure I give you that I know I'm, you're going to love. Because, oh, where is it? Oh, this is going to aggravate me. Why can I not remember the name of the company? Oh, there it is. The company is Sweat X. Um, they uh, make a bunch of wonderful sports stuff that you're going to, if you've got a kid that does sports, you're going to be loving all of this. So I'm actually going to uh, make sure I, I give you the name of everything on here. So if you go on Amazon and you look for Sweat X, um, I'm, uh, they are a um, line that's designed for athletic wear and for sports teams. And they make the state uh, extreme stain remover. And I know that sounds cheesy, but trust me on this stuff, it rocks. It works on clay. It works on grass teams. It works on blood. It works on all the things you expect to happen after a good rough and tumble sports team game. So um, it's a spray product designed for uniform shirts and uniform pants. It kicks butt and takes names. You will love it. Um, I um, also will say for professional cleaners, if you're struggling with stains in your microfiber, it does a darn good job on those too. Um, I found this product because in my previous work for Made Pro, a huge residential cleaning franchise, we used a ton of microfiber towels and getting the towels stained was a big issue because we were cleaning these you know, greasy kitchens and whatever else. And um, we'd end up with all these awful stains on our towels a lot of times. And um, the laundry cycle would help, but sometimes it'd still be discolored. And uh, this uh, Sweat X company's stain product does a darn good job. Um, you know, uh, I've even tested taking things like straight lipstick. Um, lipstick is the pain in the butt because it's all pigments and oils and smearing that into microfiber. If you run, you run that through the wash, you will see the lipstick still standing right there. Um, the, um, the, uh, sweat X line stain remover takes it right out. It's awesome. So, um, I definitely recommend that one. I'm going to actually drop that in the comments right now for you. So you can check that out and hope you love it. Let's see here. We got some more questions hanging out. Let me keep up here. I got the question here. Um, can I, I sent an email to you with a picture. There is mold underneath the plastic trim that I can't get to. 
Okay, let me see if I can find this picture. I'm guessing you sent it to ask an expert at rectifiberwholesale.com, which is really cool that we can do that actually and share this information. That'd be great. Let me see if I can pull this up real quick for you. So smart, by the way, if anyone ever wants to do that um, going forward, if you want to send me questions that you know you're going to be asking in the live and you want to email ask an expert at microfiberwholesale.com first, send me some questions, that would be awesome. Um, and go ahead and send me those pictures so I know exactly what you're talking about. Let's see if I can find this for you. Um, hopefully you put your name in your email. I'm not, uh, forgive me, uh, Was what name do you have on your email so I can find this thing? Oh, wait, I think I found it. Here we go. Uh, let's see. Well, you sent me some pictures of a before and after. Sorry, guys, I'm trying to find this picture. I want to help this person. I got so many people sending me stuff. I'm trying to figure out which person this is. All right. So unfortunately, I found your email, I think. Um, but I see that we interacted in a couple emails, but I don't have a picture here. So um, if you can post this somewhere else um, or maybe DM it to uh, our Facebook page or something, I'll see. Oh, here we go. Got it, got it, got it. All right. I finally got the pictures. Yay. All right. So it looks like there is plastic trim in your shower and it's blocking old area. Oh, that's annoying as heck. I am sorry. Um, now I see it. I know exactly why you're complaining. So this is going to be a sticky wicket situation in that it looks like there's caulking along the trim. And then there's a part where the caulking got compromised and mold started to grow in there and is now kind of taking over and doing its little thing. But you really can't get to it. There's this caulking on the sides. You're not going to like my answer, but you're going to need to either yourself or with the contractor get the caulking removed in that section, deep clean in there, and then really seal it up properly. I know, I know that's not what you wanted to hear. No one's going to like me on this one, but this is why we get aggravated with installers. I, I would be very blunt. When you get something like this installed, whether it's a shower glass door or whatever it is, anything around a wet area, it has to be sealed well and effectively to keep it looking right long-term. It just does. Contractor wasn't being careful and they left gaps. It is all too easy for a shower, water, or away and get in whatever little hole was left, fester, gutter and body oils and the dirt around the house or whatever seeped into that little spot and grow inside there. Um, that's why we're counting on the contractor to be the professional and do his job right and make sure he leave a, uh, left a good seal. It's also a, on us as homeowners or apartment owners to maintain what has been installed. So if this was installed a while ago, it's on us to keep an eye on all of the uh, caulking and sealants and uh, you know workmanship in our home. If we start to see gaps in our grout, if we start to see gaps in our caulking, because over time it's going to have wear life, especially if you're scrubbing and eventually you, know, you uh, pop open a spot. We've got to be ready with a caulking gun to get and plug that up right away before stuff gets in there and starts to grow. Now it's hard. Of course, you are, didn't probably didn't see it. You're living your life. You're running around. And then all of a sudden you look over and go, ew, what the heck? You know, so I'm not blaming you. It's life. But it is important to be aware of any compromise to a seal, especially in a wet area like a bathroom to shower. It's just asking for this to happen eventually. And the only thing you really can do at this point is uh, you're going to take a, a caulking remover. Um, you can get them at the hardware store. These like little, you know, uh, basically putty knife on one side, a little pointy thing on the other side. And you scrape off the caulking so you can get up in there. You're going to you know, squirt in your favorite Tylex type product. And with a uh, bottle brush, you know, a little skinny wire brush, scrub around in there and get it all clean as best you can. 
get all that out and flush it with some water. Let it air dry thoroughly because we don't want we don't want to trap more water in there to cause the problem again. But let it air out well. Blow it a blow dryer in there if you have to. Get it good and dry inside, and then go ahead with a caulking gun with clear caulking. Reseal up the edges so that it, no more water gets in there and it doesn't grow any further. Hope that helps. And again, sorry it took me so long to find that. Victor, hello, it's Friday. Hey, Victor, you're you're my loyal ones, and I thank you for that. So glad you're here. Um, I gotta say, it's so nice to have some regular uh, watchers. Uh, Crystal, I see you here, and um, uh, Victor, I've seen you here. It, it's uh, it's pretty awesome to start having a little bit of a following. Thank you guys for the support. It means so much. Um, let's see here. Next question I got. Um, I took your advice from last week about proper amount of detergent that should be used. And oh my goodness, what a difference. You know, <laughs> it's a thing, guys. Uh, I'm so glad it worked for you. But uh, it is fascinating how many people sit there complaining about the challenge of having either clean floors or cleaning the, their uh, machine or whatever it is, not realizing that they're making things worse. And it's so frustrating. I feel bad for people. You know, I, I go online and I see all these like, you know, Reddit sub threads or people complaining on uh, social media about, you know, cleaning hacks. And really half the time, it's they're using the wrong product that's made things worse or they're using too much soap or whatever it is. And again, because we don't teach this stuff in school, we don't teach people how stuff works. We just tell them, go use it. They don't, they don't understand that they are causing their own problems and how to stop it. Um, it's one of those things that my, you know, my retirement life, I want to encourage people to bring back domestic arts in school, a home ec, um, and convince people to teach it as a part of the science curriculum, as part of the social studies curriculum. You know, it used to be, oh, this is women's work. It doesn't need it anymore. It's not that difficult. When actually all these life skills that we're not teaching anymore are really a great opportunity to teach STEM. You know, uh, they can be incorporated into the science curriculum very easily and teach how soaps work and how uh, heat works in changing um, the uh, amount of soils uh, water can hold by, based on heat. And there's so many fun experiments you can do. They can teach a lot of science principles while also teaching people how to properly care for their home. Uh, it's a two for one shot and I wish we did it more. Uh, so that, you know, uh, hint, hint my child's book when I get old, uh, but we'll, we'll get there. <laughs> Although uh, look at looks of things I've kind of already gotten there, but we won't go there. <laughs> All right. Um, I bought the laundry sheets after last week. Oh, thank you. I'm so happy to hear that. You know, um, I I don't know how often I've mentioned this, but I will mention to people that when possible, you know, if you can A, use less detergent, or also there's a lot of those uh, uh, dry laundry sheets that are coming out. There's such a wonderful impact to the environment for doing that. Um, when you're going through a ton of detergent, not only are you wasting product and you're clogging up the waterways, but you're also making all these empty bottles that just keep filling up landfills. And we really don't, and, oh, that's actually something I should bring up. I want to make sure I got out before the end of this session. If we're going to talk laundry. Let's talk recycling your laundry detergent bottles. This is a big problem. And I mean big. So I'll explain why it's so big. When you recycle, everyone's like, cool, I've recycled. I used up the laundry detergent. Let me throw it in the recycling bin. Yay, good me. What they don't realize is you're responsible for thoroughly rinsing any bottle that contains something concentrate like laundry detergent. If you do not, you are contaminating the entire batch of plastic that this bottle goes into. This is why, by the way, most foreign countries are refusing to take the America's trash anymore. You know how we used to like recycle everything and they'd squish it in little cubes and they'd ship it off somewhere else. And we were like, oh great, they'll magically fix it for us. Well, what's happening on the other end is they'd get our trash and we had treated it like trash and our recycling programs were trash. So all the recyclable goods were full of maple syrup and laundry detergent and shampoo residue and whatever else was in there because we weren't trained properly to take care of our recycling properly. And they said, this is garbage. I can't recycle this. I can't melt this down and make me plastic. It's full of crap. And they would shove it in their landfill and it never got recycled. And this continued until they said, we're out of room. To heck with you. Stop sending me your nonsense. You don't know how to recycle right. So this is me helping all of you. 
If you want your recyclable goods to actually get recycled, rinse them, particularly if they have things like soap, residue, cleaning stuff like laundry detergent in them. Um, rinse out the inside, cut it open if you have to to see inside, make sure it's clean before you put it in there and you will not be destroying an entire uh, cube loads worth of um, plastics that could have been reused but can't be because they're now full of detergent. So please, please, please address that. Um, this is actually one of the reasons that things like the Tide Pods are actually wonderful in that, uh, and also the, uh, you know, all the dishwashing pods and all those as well, they control portions so people aren't glug, glug, glugging anymore. And they make it much easier to recycle the container they came in because the recycled, the, the container they came in is now dry as opposed to coated with liquid detergent. So there's several reasons to consider switching to a pod or a sheet type detergent because it's going to help you use the right amount. It's going to help you recycle more effectively, um, which is, you know, two for one special. Uh, let's see here. Next question. I just ordered my Sweatex. Thank you. Yes, Jenny, you're going to love it. Honestly, um, I was impressed and surprised by the performance when I played with it. Um, it was uh, one of the pro last products I was testing actually before I started leaving uh, my old position and joining Microfiber Wholesale. Um, and um, I'm not even through with the bottle yet. And Lord knows my youngest daughter, Shana, um, should be their official tester for the line because she will get every single stain they're planning on on her every 24 hour period. Um, and so I am in a continuous state of testing staining products thanks to my adorable young daughter. And um, therefore I can tell you firsthand, um, Sweat X, really good stuff. Um, if you don't have it though, I wanna make sure I mention this to everybody. If you, uh, <coughs> if you do not have a specialty product on hand and you got stains, I want to give you some general guidance on what to do in a pinch. A number one, your laundry detergent is your best stain fighter. Everyone's always like, get the vinegar, get the baking soda, get the borax, get the whatever. And they're all lovely. But honestly, just a little straight tide right on the thing you're dealing with and a little toothbrush, 80% of the time is going to knock it out right there. Uh, detergents are extremely effective. And it's easy to add it and throw it in the wash load and be done with it. Because... Um, you know, you're not having to do all the extra steps. Um, so a little dab will do you, you'd be surprised. So toothbrush and a lot of detergent, more often than not, gonna get you right there. The next easy thing to consider is yes, vinegar and baking soda are effective, um, but <coughs> understand that they are not miracle workers. Um, any formula you see online that tells you mix vinegar and baking soda and put it away, walk away from the whole website. Just like click it, close the tab, just walk away. Because that person has no clue what the heck they're doing. Vinegar and baking soda, the benefit of mixing the two is that fizzy reaction. Um, it allows you to, for example, um, push baking soda into a stain, hit it with the vinegar, that vinegar and um, baking soda react and have that bubbly fizzy reaction, which is now going to like basically explode outward and force a breakup of all those stains. That's awesome. We like that. It's a good thing. Um, very effective. But when it's done and the baking soda and the vinegar are done reacting, it becomes salt water. That's it. Literally salt water. They have no more cleaning potential when they're spent. So if anyone thing tells you mix those two products and store it, they're telling you store salt water and whatever else essential oils and dish soap you put in it. I can't tell you how many ridiculously stupid formulas I've found online. Make your own all-purpose cleaner. Mix baking soda, vinegar, dish soap, and some essential oils and put it away. And the reality is you just made salt water with dish soap and essential oils. You could have skipped that whole theater baking soda vinegar step. It didn't do anything in the final product. It was just there for your own entertainment. It's like, oh, look, I mean, you know, I mean, like the little kid making a volcano. This is fun but it doesn't actually help you when you pull the bottle back out and you need to clean. So if you're looking at instructions online from blogs and stuff, anything that tells you to mix some uh, baking soda and vinegar on the stain actively, totally fine. Anything that tells you to mix it beforehand and store it, ignore them, they're clueless. 
<laughs> but vinegar will help you with minerals and anything that's dissolved by acid. Uh, baking soda is a, uh, a nice gentle abrasive. It does actually help break up soils as well. Um, both of those are great pre-treats to try with the stain if you're in a pinch and you don't have a good pre-treat with you. So straight tide, baking soda, vinegar, actively mixed together, totally fine. Um, some old school formulas like Fell's naphtha soap, really old school, but it's a great detergent. Um, it just comes with a block of soap. Take your little toothbrush, scrub a little lawn, scrub it in the stain, scrub a little lawn, scrub it in the stain. You'd be surprised what you can get out with some old school Fell's naphtha. Um, and again, that uh, Sweat X laundry stain remover is another wonderful product. Um, and is very good on the synthetics. One other product I need to definitely mention for Dota Talk Laundry is we've got to talk about OxyClean. It's an important product for everyone that does laundry to have sitting in their arsenal. Um, the big thing, I want to make sure I get the link for that going. Hopefully I do. <coughs> um, um, shoot, where did it go? So I want to get my OxyClean link going here. So I want to clarify about OxyClean for one second, because I think it's another misunderstood product. All right, so pop it in the link to the OxyClean. Let's talk about what it does. OxyClean is actually dry hydrogen peroxide. No, really, I'll explain. So. Sodium percarbonate, which is what um, is in OxyClean, is a dry, stable chemical that, when exposed to water, has a chemical reaction and makes hydrogen peroxide as one of the offshoots of that reaction. Hydrogen peroxide, we all know, is a wonderful whitener, oxidizer, um, a germ killer, all these wonderful things. Hydrogen peroxide is awesome. But here's the problem with hydrogen peroxide, which is it's extremely unstable at all oxidizers are, whether it's bleach or hydrogen peroxide, any oxidizer, it's trying to oxidize. It's trying to have this explosive reaction. It is going to spend itself quickly. When you get hydrogen peroxide, if you go to you know the uh, local pharmacy, you get that little brown bottle, you'll notice it's all sealed up tight. It's dark brown and they say, use it within six months. The reason being is hydrogen peroxide is extremely unstable. It doesn't want to be hydrogen peroxide. It wants to break apart. So it's good three years max from manufacturing date sealed up in that bright town, you know, that brown uh, light blocking bottle. The second you open it though, the literally the second you open it, you now have T minus six months till it's absolutely nothing but salt water. It's useless. Um, and it's uh, a bit of a bell curve in terms of the, uh, the sort of hockey stick when it comes to the, the death of its performance. It's really good fresh and drops off fast and kind of then tapers out to its sad little death. So when you open a bottle of hydrogen peroxide, you better be ready to use it, which is why I always laugh when I see people buy these big bottles. Don't. Buy the littlest bottle you can and use through. Buy a new bottle. Use through. Do not buy big bottles unless you're planning to do something massive. Because again, it's going to peter out real fast. But OxyClean lets you make exactly how much hydrogen peroxide you want on demand. It's always that freshest, straight from the manufacturer, like, you know, hot off the presses, a hydrogen peroxide the second you hit it with water, which is why it does its job so well. It's able to oxidize and brighten all those stains, and it's color safe, unlike sodium uh, hydrochloride, which is uh, chlorine bleach. So um, if you're looking for a stain fighter that is going to be non-damaging to your clothing and effective and shelf stable for an extended amount of time, OxyClean is your buddy. Bleach is going to go south in six months. Hydrogen peroxide is going to go south in six months. But OxyClean powder can hang out to the end of Armageddon doing its thing until you hit it with water. So it is a great product to have in your arsenal. It is a little slower than uh, traditional uh, chlorine bleach. That's the one downside is, you know, you hit something with a strong shot of bleach right away, it whitens in seconds. OxyClean, that chemical reaction is going to take at least a good 10 minutes to up to sometimes an hour to really get that whitening effect that you're looking for, depending on how dingy whatever it was is. 
But if you are willing to be that little bit extra patient, it gives you no damage and whitening and shelf stability. So it is your friend, um, particularly if you have anything that's white and. So this is always the nightmare when you get uh, clothing stains. You know, someone's got this uh, black and white striped shirt or, you know, a white shirt with this funky colored collar or whatever it is. And now they got a stain on it. And you're like, oh, I'm going to bleach this to get it white. But you can't because you're going to destroy all the color portion of the outfit. Uh, <coughs> OxyClean is your go-to in that situation. It will whiten the white portion. It will not remove the dye from the stained portion. It is your friend in those mixed media situations. <coughs> Forgive me. I'm going to have to take a drink of water here because I'm coughing away. And you all don't want to listen to that. This program runs on Duncan. All right, no, I'm just kidding. Let's see here. Um, let's see here. Um, what about laundry sheets? Which to buy? Great question. Um, there are a number in the industry that are pretty dang solid. To be honest, <coughs> <coughs> to be honest, all of them I'd say are at this point in life, pretty, pretty evenly matched. There's nobody that I'm like, whoa, this one is the one that knocks everyone's socks off. But I uh, will give you a sneak preview that I intend to change that in the next year. Personally, hint, hint. Yes, I'm trying to help us make one because I think we need to change that uh, and make one that is really designed for our needs as professional cleaners. But we'll see what we can pull off but uh comes into a theater near you anyhow um the reality is right now most of them are pretty comparable products i am nervously waiting though for procter and gamble to get on the sheet game because when they do they're going to come hard i will tell you um if you're ever looking for soap chemistry when it comes to laundry honestly you really have a tough time being tied and if you're deciding between the sheets and the Tide Pods, honestly, Tide Pods still wins right now. Um, Procter & Gamble, I don't say that because I used to work for them 20 years ago. I say it just because it's true. They have been in the laundry game so long. They really have such a head start on everybody that their chemistry is just so hard to beat. Um, the SweatX line that I talked about is excellent at activewear. They found a niche where they're able to do something different. But when it comes to just general laundry care, Tide still trounces them. Tide trounces everybody. Even in the commercial world where, where people are doing commercial laundry, for a while there, Tide didn't play in that market. When they entered it, they took it over in like three years because their formulas just are that good. Um, so, you know, if you're looking to manage your environmental impact, the Tide pods are going to be your best bet to solve that liquid in the bottle problem and uh, control usage and uh, dosage problems. Uh, the sheets are also awesome. Um, they are a great alternative, especially if you're looking for a greener product. And uh, at this point, um, admittedly, p and is a little behind on that game. They're not as into making that, you know, um, ultra-reduced packaging, free and clear type stuff that they should. Um, hopefully they'll get on the game eventually. Um, if you're, you know, focus is more environmentally driven. There's a number of those sheets that are excellent, um, but you are sacrificing a little bit of cleaning performance. Let's just be honest. They aren't as good as a Tide, uh, but they're not bad. You just have to do a little bit more stain fighting work before you throw things in there because they don't quite have the same punch as a Tide, but a lot of them are great. <coughs> All right. How to remove soap scum from shower glass? Wonderful question, Roy. All right, so let's talk shower glass. Shower glass, honestly, is still just glass. Uh, a lot of the ideas and rules around cleaning glass apply in showers too. It's just the soils are different than outside. Um, the biggest challenge in shower glass is soap scum and hard water and the combination of the two. Soap scum is leftover soap residue mixed with your body oils and your dead skin cells. Yum! I know. And it makes uh, it mixes with the minerals in your water to make a crust that is a mixture of 
calcified minerals and stuff and calcified you. Yay, icky. It's hard to get off. Um, you need a complex soap. Um, if you see people saying, oh, just use vinegar. Vinegar isn't going to cut through soap scum. You need detergents, you need acids, you need um, chelating agents, you need all three of those things working together to do their job. Um, some of my favorites for breaking through heavy hard water buildup and soap scum on showers are Bar Keeper's Friend and the Procter & Gamble Professional Line Comet Disinfecting Bath and Cleaner. Um, both of those are awesome. Love them. They do a rockin' good job. Um, let me see if I actually can throw some links in the comments real quick so you guys have them for later. Let me see if I can find them. I think I do. So there's the Comet Bathroom. I'll just pop up there quickly so you have it and gets in the comments. Um, <coughs> and let me get the Barkeeper's Friend in there as well. Awesome stuff. I recommend both strongly. Um, if you're looking for um, a non-bleach based bathroom cleaner in the residential world, again, I like the Comet Bathroom myself commercially, but residential wise, uh, Lysol Power Bathroom Foamers, some pretty darn good stuff too. They make a great, great product as well. That's great for general home consumer use and does a lovely job and disinfects and cuts the subscope quite nicely. Um, if you're in really bad hard water area, Kaboom is another wonderful one that does a great job cutting through that hard water quite nicely as well. One thing I should mention, though, is you asked about the shower glass, but you didn't tell you what type of shower you had. If you have a shower that has sensitive stone in it, so you've got granite and travertine and marble and whatever else in your fussy stone shower, you've got to be very careful about the bathroom cleaners you choose. Anyone that has a stone shower, please be careful. You know, people look for soap scum products, not really realizing a lot of them are acidic. And acidic bathroom products and stone showers are a no good mix, um, especially if it's granite or marble or travertine or any acid sensitive stone. Also, even non acid sensitive stones, those sealants that you use to protect the stone are acid sensitive too. So even if the stone can handle it, the sealant may not be able to. And constantly using acidic bathroom cleaners will wash off that sealant and leave that stone porous and more prone to staining. So um, be careful with acids and stone bathrooms. In that case, you're going to want to get a specialty product at, <coughs> that is Stone Pro Stone and Glass Scrub. Um, if you've got bad shower glass that has gotten really bad because you couldn't use acids and you didn't know how to take care of it, the Stone Pro has a jeweler jeweler's uh, polish grit to it that's really ultra fine that allows you to scour off any buildup on that shower and get it nice and clean without damaging any of the stone. Um, so for basic cleaning of that shower glass, honestly, if you just keep up with it regularly, you're not going to have an issue. Um, I love to see when people have nice shower glass, and they have that little squeegee and the little suction cup they keep in their shower. That is a good find, people. Do it. Uh, when I, if you have that really pretty shower glass and you want to keep it looking nice, just even for a couple of seconds, after the end of your shower, it's going to make such a difference in terms of your maintenance of that poor shower. Um, regular cleaning is also going to make a huge difference. The big thing I see a lot of people doing in all uh, cleaning is they don't like something, so they put it off till it's miserable, and then they go do it, and it's miserable. And so they say, hey, it was miserable. I don't want to do that again. And they put it off again all the way for another time till it's bad. If you break the cycle, if you just clean things frequently, it's not bad. You go, oh, I, that shower was awful. I scrubbed for hours. I hated that. I'm not going to do it again for a month. And now it's nasty again. Versus if you just went back there next week and wiped it all down and said, oh, that took me two seconds. It's clean. I just need to wipe it down. A little, you know, basic bathroom cleaner and away I go. If you do that regularly, it never gets to the place where you're like, oh my God, I have to scrub. So you're trapping yourself in your own cycle. You got to learn how to be a cycle breaker. Stop yourself. Get it deeply cleaned and then commit to regularly cleaning it frequently before those stains build up and then subs comes a breeze. Um, other thing I will mention is for shower glass, um, they do make uh, sealants and hydrophobic coatings that I definitely recommend if either you want to get those professionally done or any of those sort of like home Rain-X type products. Um, they are wonderful for helping water sheet off of the shower glass and making it easier to maintain. So if you know, I just don't have time in the morning to squeegee, 
I'm sorry, Mel. I don't care if it helps. I'm not going to do it. I just know my, I know myself. I don't have time for this nonsense. Totally valid. Okay. In that case, you want to get one of those hydrophobic coating type products. Hydrophobic, by the way, is uh, fancy for repels water. So like a rain X. Um, and if you, if you type in shower, rain X, shower, hydrophobic coatings, you're going to see all the competitors out there. There's some stuff that's um, meant to be to put on at home DIY. There's some stuff you can get installed by somebody. So if you've got a really nice shower door, don't DIY it. Get the guy who installed it to put the coating on for you. Um, that will help the water sheet off and keep that shower glass looking gorgeous way longer. Um, sealants in general are your friend for all things soap scum, bath, hard water, grossness. Uh, the more sealants you can use in your life, the happier you will be. Um, great question. Does OxyClean disinfect? Ooh, dicey question. And the answer is no, unofficially. So here's the issue. Yes, it's making hydrogen peroxide. And yes, hydrogen peroxide is a disinfectant. But <coughs> they have absolutely zippy do not control how much hydrogen peroxide you are making in that laundry cycle because they don't know if you have a full load or a half load, you used a quarter cup or a half cup or what you did. So they are not making any legal claims towards disinfection because they have no say over how you're using this as a laundry additive versus using it as a disinfectant. So um, <coughs> hydrogen peroxide that you're getting in the bottle to like clean a cup as an antiseptic, cool beans. Laundry cycle is just cleaning and brightening and whitening um, and don't try to make it into a disinfectant. But I will note, if you want to disinfect your laundry, that's really your question, what you need is your dryer, not a chemical. Hear me out, guys. There's only so many different ways you kill germs. Basically, you're, you're trying to destroy the germ, and there's only so many ways to do that. You can poison it, you can burn it, you can dissolve it, or you can cook it. <laughs> that's really basically how it goes. Um, bleach is of the poison destroy it company. Citric acid is of the dissolve company. Um, and heat is of the cook it party. Um, if you have ever heard about disinfecting with steam, you already understand that heat kills germs. You cook them to a golden brown and they're nice and dead. Steam does it really fast. If I you know, have really high powered, high pressure steam in a few seconds, I can kill the germs in that surface really fast. But most home consumers don't have high powered steam. Any of those residential models you've got will tell you you have to be there for several minutes on a spot to kill the germs because it's not as hot. And it's pretty epic the difference. It goes from like the ones they use in hospitals are like 30 seconds to sanitization. You're like five minutes to dis uh, five, five minutes to disinfection type of thing. And like it's a big drop depending on how powerful your steamer is. Heat and laundry, same situation. If you use the disinfecting cycle of your laundry machine, they're going to blast it with a lot of high heat and steam to kill germs, which sounds awesome, except for if you're using fabrics that you don't want melted. If it's cotton towels or something that can handle high heat, good to go ahead, put those cycles on and blast the hell out of your cotton towels. They'll be nice and disinfected. If you're doing something like synthetic shirts or athletic wear or microfiber towels, so I got to wrap the brand here. You do not want high heat near any of those. You will melt the synthetic plastic fibers and now you've destroyed the thing you're trying to disinfect. The good news is all you need is 135 degrees for one hour. That's the magic, which by the way, in English for your machine at home is permanent press or medium heat for one hour. If you use that, that is enough to cook all your germs to a nice golden brown and uh, sanitize that laundry cycle as long as it's been properly laundered beforehand and the soils are gone. Whatever's left in the uh, residue on the towels when they hit the dryer, if they're in there for one hour at a minimum of 135 degrees, that is enough to create sanitization and get your towels good to go, germs killed. I've heard a lot of people asking me, oh, I couldn't possibly use, you know, uh, reusable towels to clean my uh, bathroom because I'm worried about germs getting in the laundry. I don't want to have, you know, dirty germs that were on a toilet or a, a bathroom floor in my towels. Ew, ew, ew. And you think that because again, you don't know the science. If you launder them fully, get them nice and clean, and you put them in the dryer at that heat, all of the organic matter that you're worried about, you know, the poo residue, sorry, I will go there, 
will have long since been flushed out during the laundry cycle. And in the dryer, any remaining bacteria will have been cooked and killed by that 135 degree heat for one hour. And those towels are perfectly safe to use again, completely ready to get back into service. So if you're one of those people that's been constantly using disposable products to clean your uh, bathroom and toilet, please stop. Mother Nature is crying. Get a reusable microfiber towel and clean them properly. Thank you. And put it in the laundry. Um, actually, I should shamelessly plug here, see if I got one. Yeah, I do. All right. Big hint, since we're talking about a lot of people asking about showers and soap scum. Big hint for you all. You want waffle weave. No one's told you this before, so I'm going to tell you now. You want waffle weave. So, all microfiber is microfiber, right? We want microfiber because it has this really tiny, thin fibers that um, create a lot of friction and grab onto and hold onto all that dirt. Yay, we love that. But how you weave it changes how it performs. It will still have that same locking action of the tiny fibers, but how the pattern in which you weave it can make a huge difference in how you are able to clean with it. In this case, we're looking at waffle weave. And what waffle weave does is it makes this sort of like honeycomb textured highs and lows. And what that does is it gives you your scrubbiest microfiber towel. I love Terry Weave, don't get me long, wrong, all those classic all-purpose towels are lovely. They're soft, they dust, they slide, they glide, but they're not as scrubby. When you get a Waffle Weave towel, it has some scrub to it. It makes some friction. And that is hugely important in bathrooms for all those stuck on hairs on the base of the toilet and stuck on hairs on the base of the tub and the floor. Bathrooms are moist, oily, gross spaces. And so uh, hair and pet hair and dirt and dust cling onto everything in these layers because all that oil and moisture um, and it dries on. And then you go to clean and it's not coming off. When you use a waffle towel, it has that pocketed friction to get to the sticky stuff, to get to the oily stuff, to get to the soap scum and to create that friction against the hairs and get it all up. Um, if you are struggling to clean your bathrooms with your usual uh, cotton towels or um, microfiber towels, get yourself some waffle towels. You will be so much happier. I will tell you, um, I recommended these for the franchise I worked with for um, over 10 years. And everyone agreed, oh my God, the bathrooms and the kitchen, these are so much easier now that I've got these nice scrubby microfiber towels. Microfiber will always perform well. I mean, you can do any room in the house with an all-purpose towel. It's true. That's why it's called all-purpose. But it's going to be a heck of a lot easier when you get yourself some waffles. So there's an insider tip. Uh, let's see here. Hi, I jumped in late and I have a uh, um, pro who wants to try to bleach, try a bleach-based products. Thoughts? All right. So... I'm guessing based on that question that you work with a professional cleaning company. And my advice to you is going to be as a professional to professional, not as a fresh professional to home consumer. So everyone else here, either block your ears or, you know, take the secrets with you to the grave. You have to clean differently as a professional than a home consumer because of liability. When a cleaner is going to clean someone's home, you are legally liable for the damage you cause. And your insurance should have covered your workmanship, but a lot of people in cleaning companies don't understand how insurance works. And some of the small guys accidentally get insurance that covers like, you know, trip and fall or something, but doesn't actually cover defects in workmanship. So by the way, if you run a cleaning company, double check your insurance policy, hear me on this. Make sure you understand what you've got as a policy because not all of them cover defects in workmanship. <coughs> if you use bleach in the customer's home and through negligence or, uh, or misuse, get it on their shower curtains or their um, uh, bath mats or uh, whatever else in that bathroom, you're legally liable for replacing them. And I wish that was the cheap stuff. If your bleach bottle drips along the hallway after you cleaned that bathroom and now you're going off to the bedrooms and the sprayer of that bleach bottle is hanging and dripping, now the hallway has got bleach marks all the way over to that bedroom you went to. You're responsible for that whole hallway getting replaced. Bleach is magnetically attracted to the most expensive thing within 500 feet. I know I don't have scientific fact facts to prove that one, but from years of professional cleaning, I can tell you, bleach is magnetically attracted to expensive things. <laughs> it just is, including uniforms. 
So if you're cleaning professionally, I would encourage you minimize bleach usage as much as possible. It is such a high liability item. It really is so easy to trash so much, so quickly, so so mindlessly. You weren't even trying to. You were doing your best work. You're there rushing from room to room and you don't even notice you're dripping and there you go. There's, you know, all the profits from that clean and the next clean all gone because you trashed somebody's carpets. It's not worth it. Um, but there are some times you're going to need bleach professionally as well. In those cases, I recommend trying to stick to powdered products whenever possible. So Comet Powder, for example, is one of the few bleach products I would suggest professionals keep with them in their arsenal. Reason being is you have a much better shot of delivering that bleach to the spot you want it to happen and not dripping everywhere else. If you're using like a Tylex or any of those spray bottle products, you're very prone to all that dripping situation going on. When you have the Comet Powder, it's dried powder, it's not activated. So if you knock over that whole can, I can vacuum it up without damaging anything. Um, you want to be careful that as a pro cleaner, you are thinking through the impact <laughs> of what you're bringing into that house. And that comet powder means I can bring it, I can accidentally knock it over, I can have anything go wrong, and I'm still not going to trash people's stuff. I can take it and wet that surface, sprinkle a little on, or my trick to save some money is you take a bowl, sprinkle a little in there, put a little water, and then use your you know sponge or your towel or your scrub brush, whatever you're using, to apply it only where you need it. Uh, that's a big hit for everybody, but particularly for the professionals, if you want to reduce bleach usage, you're going to use a normal acid-based typical bathroom cleaner to clean that shower, tub, whatever situation you've got going on. Clean it all. Let it, the product soak. Let it sit a full 10 minutes. Give it a good scrub down lightly. Get it all done. And then look and see where they're staining. You don't need bleach on the whole thing. You need it on a couple spots. When you find what the stains are, after you've pre-cleaned everything, you can take that bowl, put a little comet in there, a little water, and take your brush and dab a do ya. Cover all those little spots where the, you know, the grout's gotten a little discolored or whatever. There's, you know, some little problem. Dab it around. Let it sit. Continue to clean the rest of the bathroom. Maybe get the toilet done. Maybe get the, uh, you know, uh, fold some towels, whatever you need to do. And come back at the end and scrub those last annoying spots that were now bleached. Rinse them. Wipe it down to get all the uh, water off and leave a nice, beautiful shine. If you go ham with a big can of Comet in this dirty shower that you're starting from scratch, and you're like, I'm going to load half this can in here. It's going to fly everywhere. It's going to get wet and soapy and now activated bleach. And it's going to be the same as if you had the spray where now you're getting it all over your uniform, all over their shower um, curtains, all over their bath mats, all over everything. So long-winded answer for, I would recommend sticking to acid-based bathroom cleaners as a professional bringing powdered bleach to use on spot treatment as needed only. If your consumer insists on bleach, let them provide it to you and make it clear that they are taking on the liability for what this product does to the surfaces of their home. Now, the reality is you're still going to be on the hooks for it if they come after you in a lawsuit, but it at least will give them pause to think twice about do they really want you to douse everything in Tylex. One last note as a professional I want to give you here, just because you know, professional, professional here. Um, if you notice a mold problem in your customer's bathroom, and that's probably why you're asking for bleach, you are professionally obligated to explain to them the importance of getting that addressed quickly by a contractor. Quick education for everybody here. There's a huge difference between surface mildew and impregnating mold. So let's talk the difference real quick. All mold is mold. It's all mold spores. It's all, you know, little spores that grow and, you know, do their thing. The difference is mildew is what grows flat on the surface. It's a well-sealed grout that isn't absorbing water. The mold spore lands, it grows, you scrub it off, the grout's in good condition, everyone's happy. Mold is the term where we started to use for when it's now getting three-dimensional and it's growing into things. This grout that was here, the sealant has worn off, it's now porous, water is getting in, mold is growing in, it grows in and behind the tile into the backing and into the sub walls and is now eating away anything organic you can find until the whole wall is destroyed. It's a bad day. Your home consumer needs to address it before their walls cave in. If you as a professional cleaner are maintaining the home, it's your job to alert them because they may not realize they have a problem. 
if you're there every week with a bleach based product, hiding all their moldy spots for them, they don't realize that their grout sealant is compromised. Water is now absorbing and their tiles are now getting rotted from behind. It's on you to tell them because they have no idea. They're trusting you. If it's a little surface stuff that scrubs off easily with your normal bathroom cleaner, you don't have to alert them about that. That means their sealants are in good shape. But if you're cleaning and you're finding all these spots in the grout that are black and discolored and you scrub at them and it's clearly in the grout, that has to be addressed. It has to be resealed. That means the grout is porous, water is getting in, and the wall is getting ruined every time they shower. And if you don't tell them and you keep bleaching the front to make it look good for them, eventually their whole wall is going to go spongy, spongy, and the tiles are going to start falling off like rain. It's going to be all black underneath. Go ahead and type in the line, moldy shower grout, <laughs> you know, nightmares, and you'll see these old, you know, 60s bathrooms with the tile just popping off in this black sub wall. And at that point, they got to rip out the whole shower all the way down to the studs, scrub it with concrobium, which is a product they use to kill uh, uh, mold spores commercially, and get it all stripped down and redo the whole sucker. It is a big expense, okay? That could have been avoided with just a little sealant before it all got destroyed. So as a professional, it's your job to say to the customer, hey, just a heads up. I know you gave me Tylex. This is no longer mildew. This is mold. Mold is growing in the grout, not on the grout. Once it's growing in, that means water is getting in there. That means your walls are getting eaten by mold. I can use this Tylex today to clean it for you to look good on the surface, but water is still absorbing in your walls and damage is still being done. You need to get a contractor or yourself to seal off this grout quickly before there's wall damage. I will use the Tylex for you every time I visit per your request, but I'm gonna keep reminding you lovingly you need to deal with this just because it looks white doesn't mean it's okay. It means there's water in your walls. Please <laughs> go get it before your house is trash. Um, also, if you see grap uh, gaps in their grout, same thing. Have this conversation. If you're they're scrubbing away at gapped old grout, you are pushing more water in their walls and contributing to the damage of their bathroom. Um, it is our job as professionals to save people for themselves. And if nothing else, get it in an email and writing so they come after you later saying, hey, my wall's trashed. You can say, I gave you ample warning. This was you with the home consumer who chose to neglect your property. It's not my fault. So I hope that helps. Now, <coughs> we are well over the hour. I thank everyone that came, stayed hanging out. Hopefully you all learned some fun stuff. I will shamelessly plug one last time that we do have our special QR code today, Laundry15 enjoy please go buy some stuff support this channel and most importantly like subscribe follow hit all the buttons uh say you're coming to next week's one so you don't forget and most importantly share please get this information out there our goal is to democratize cleaning information and make sure everyone knows how to clean like an expert my goal is when i retire is that they don't need me anymore because everyone knows what they're doing that's the mark i want to leave on this community so get out there let everyone know you have an expert in your back pocket. Come join, have fun, sit and watch, eat your lunch with me, I don't care, and learn what you need to know to take care of yourself in your home. And I'll see you all next week.